Well, as a result of the HIV epidemic in Scott County, um, the state has really been looking at instituting needle exchange programs um, in areas where there's um, increased transmission um, of hepatitis C and HIV. Uh, Senate Bill 461, uh, outlines a process that local health departments can use to determine if this is something that they need to begin implementing in their community. Um, we're very blessed to have a very dynamic and proactive board and we've been talking about this with them since the Senate bill passed. And last night we were talking with them about what would be the criteria that we would want to use locally here to determine if there is actually an outbreak of hepatitis C or HIV occurring. Because the um, definition of an outbreak is just more than what you would normally see. And there's really no other official definition of a 10% increase or et cetera. So we wanted to get their input as, as representatives of the community, wanted to get their input. And it was their determination based on all that we know, the numbers that we've had, about a 20% increase in cases here locally. It was their opinion that we should go ahead and open the needle exchange program as soon as we can. 250 is about where we are usually for the whole year. Um, but when you look at, we've had 270 for the first three quarters of this year. So it's, it's going to end up being a significant increase um, of, of uh, people with hepatitis C. And hepatitis C is just more easily transmitted than HIV. Uh, we have seen a slight increase in HIV, but you know nothing as significant as what we're seeing with hepatitis C. Well, actually what we're looking for is to get the best utilization, you want to be where the folks are. And so we've been looking at areas based on um, emergency runs for overdoses, based on input from law enforcement. We've identified some areas um, that, that would be good where we probably would be able to um, have access to a lot of people that could benefit from this program. And so we're working with um, an agency to be able to house it um, half a day a week or so in their facility. And we're in negotiations right now, so I can't say where it is, but um, the best place would be to put it where people are going to actually use it. And so we're going into that area. Roughly about $5, depending on how fancy you want to get and what you want to offer with it. Um, we're using the standard kit that uh, um, most uh, harm reduction programs or needle exchange programs uh, recommend. What I think a lot of people may not realize unfortunately, including uh, injection drug users, are that the materials, the cotton ball, the what's called a cooker, um, the band-aids, all those sorts of things are make it very easy to transmit hepatitis C. So it's not just the needle and the syringe, but it's all the other equipment because hepatitis C is so much more stable. So um, we'll have the full complement of things to actually reduce and minimize the risk of acquiring hepatitis C or HIV in those kits. And we figure, and then we'll also give them a sharps container so that they can put dirty needles in. A lot of communities have really seen a marked improvement in the number of dirty needles laying around that law enforcement officers can unfortunately get stuck with, kids can get stuck with because people discard them. We'll give them a um, box um, that they'll be able to collect them in and then return those when they pick up their clean needles. So. Uh, probably about $5 per kit all in. And then would it be free for the people coming to get it? That's our hope. Okay. Um, we're looking at there are uh, a number of um, programs that are do um, in other communities that are donating supplies, so we're hopeful that we could get something that would not cost the taxpayer money. Um, so, you know, it would be a minimal Im uh, impact on the rest of the community in terms of costs. So hopefully that's the way route we'll be able to go. And I, you know, I, I really can appreciate how when you think about that, you think it's just counterintuitive that you're somehow not really condoning it, encouraging it, so that you'll see increased usage, uh, not only among people that are already using, but increased usage among other people saying, hey, how cool is that? Um, these have really been a part of comprehensive plans throughout the world for about 20 years. And they've really been studied. That issue has been completely studied by a number of organizations. And the conclusion is it does not facilitate or promote IV drug use. It does not increase crime. In fact, the, the one good benefit is, on average, probably about a 30% reduction in HIV cases in areas where they're actually implemented and used. So it can't be just that we're offering it. People have to actually use it and use it every time. Um, to use the clean needles. but uh, And then the other thing is a number of studies have also shown that when you offer comprehensive services like we will, um, which would be include screening for addiction, um, screening for mental health issues like depression, anxiety, and then offer referrals for those folks, you actually can see an increase in people actually going for and completing addiction services. 
that's not why we're doing it, but that's a really good benefit for uh, to accompany the reduction in HIV and hepatitis C. I know a lot of people, I, 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 I've heard from people, um, and I understand their concerns. I think number one thing I want to highlight is, again, this has been well studied. Every major medical organization and um, federal health agency supports this. The CDC, the Surgeon General, the Department of Health and Human Services, the AMA, they all, the Institute of Medicine, NIH, everybody supports this because it's really been studied. And it's shown to be, especially when you use it as we are, as one tool in the toolbox to address the opiate crisis. It's not the only thing that we're doing, but it's one thing we're doing to minimize the risk of HIV and hepatitis C while we're trying to address the primary issues. Why are so many people turning to IV drugs? So that's our main goal. This is something so that while we're addressing this, we don't have an unfortunate incident like they had in, in Scott County, where now you're gonna try and it's gonna take decades to recover from 180 people and a population of 4,500 acquiring HIV. And that's the tip of the iceberg because some of those people were sex workers and you don't know who they had contact with. So, you know, I, I, I hope people can put it in perspective, realize it's part of a plan. We're not the first ones doing it. I don't ever want to be the first one, but I don't want to be the last one. Um, this has been studied. I hope they have the confidence that the board and the department, uh, the CDC, the State Department of Health have all made this very thoughtful decision that this is, is another, another thing we can do to minimize the long-term costs uh, to Allen County in Indiana. We probably what we're initially going to look at for our donors, uh, grants that we can write for. I think that, uh, you know, when you read uh, what lawmakers at the federal level, they're really concerned about this opiate crisis, as they well should be. This is a serious crisis, the IV drug. It's in the 18 to 25 year old population that we're seeing the greatest number of people turning to IV drugs. That's a lifetime, if we can prevent this or treat this, it's a lifetime of illness that we're gonna see. Uh, I think that we need the federal government to come on board with evidence-based scientific recommendations that reduce the, the chances of other people getting other diseases that are gonna only make the treatment of the addiction harder. And so I would really like to see, they've made a real commitment and they're very concerned about the opiate crisis. They're very concerned. Well, this is, a money, is an evidence-based cost-effective tool that I think some federal dollars should be released to go for. Again, I get, the, I get it. I get, nobody wants to, but you know, I mean, we have to get over that. We have to put our big boy pants on and we have to do what it takes to keep our community healthy and safe. Uh, while we're dealing with this crisis. The process is pretty well outlined in Senate Bill 461. The next thing we'll do is before we um, actually have a public hearing or before we actually um, uh, take it to the state health commissioner, we need to get public official, local public official approval. And so what we're doing is right now we're creating our information packets that we'll meet one-on-one -on -one with public officials if they're interested. I just ha had a meeting with um, some other medical folks that we explained what's going on to. So we'll keep players and stakeholders in the community. I want to offer an opportunity one-on-one -on -one to be able to discuss their concerns. Um, and then we'll develop a community education campaign that uh, can help un people understand um, again, the context in which we're doing this, that this is part of a, part of a comprehensive plan and it's harm reduction. And um, get people familiar and comfortable with that terminology. And then we'll um, ask the, once we get local approval, we'll ask the state health commissioner to declare an emergency. I met with him already today, uh, by chance we had a meeting set. And I think he, he understands and understands this in an evidence-based approach. And then we'll continue with our logistics moving forward, setting it up. There's a lot of moving parts in a pro as you can imagine, a lot of collaboration. Again, we're very blessed in Allen County to have a lot of people willing to work on this and offer their services as referrals, et cetera. So nailing all that down. My goal would be if we get the approval to do it, that we would be ready to open by January, mid-January. We've done a lot of the, the logistical work. We thought through who's going to do what, what do they need to do, what services they need to offer, all those sorts of things. Now it's nailing down. And again, I'd like to do it with with the community. I don't want to have, you know, sort of an adversarial relationship with anybody. I, I think the evidence is there. Um, as a physician, I rely on research done by other people. I, I have to make decisions every 15 minutes and I have to rely on places like the CDC, AMA, uh, Institute of Medicine to help me make those decisions. And so when they say this is something you should be doing, you know, I'm not very likely to disagree with them.
and I hope I can bring everybody else along with us. And there would just be one center, correct? Yes, okay. for now, but you know, we'll see how it takes out. They haven't really been heavily utilized in other communities. Um, again, this only works if people take advantage of it. I mean, you have to, you have to become intentional about protecting your life. And uh, so there needs to be a commitment on everybody's part, not just the Department of Health, not just the community, but the IV drug users themselves have to be a real part of this uh, team to minimize the consequences of this. So, you know, we'll see how this one is utilized and of course we'll meet the need. That, that there's a greater need will certainly open more often or different locations, et cetera.